Hey guys, it's Rod Erkman here with another episode review of The White Lotus, Season 2, Episode 5, That's Amore. Well, I guess we only have two more episodes left, which seems kind of short, but I didn't go back and look and see how many episodes the first season have. But seven seems like an odd number, but whatever, here we are. So, let's get started. I'm going to do it character by character, just so that way we can get into all the nitty-gritty and full of full kiki, Okay. So let's start off with Valentina because, oop, I guess y'all were right. Like, I would know two lesbians unless they're like munching down on each other because clearly that's the case. She's just a sad, lonely lesbian, which again fits in with the archetype we have from the previous season with the sad, lonely gay manager. So, if they're going to do this like every season, like keep the same archetypes, that's fine, but at least do something kind of interesting with them, right? Because didn't the manager in the last season have something going on with one of the people who worked there? But whatever, since I'm a Valentina fan, I'm just going to let this ride, okay? So I think Valentina is like catching feelings for like Isabella or whatever, uh, which is like why she gave her the star. Who knew, right? And so what she does is really cute. So she like moves Rocco like out the way and sends him to the beach club and then brings up this other homely man up there. So I was like, oh girl, like you're messy. But I like it. Like again, like I'm just going to give her the benefit of the doubt that she just wants a friend-ish that maybe she's not looking for sex-ish. But since I was already wrong with her being a lesbian anyway, I'm like literally like 0-2 with this whole situation. So I'm going to let y'all kind of decide or whatever. But, you know, I, I mean, I like her. I get, I like the, her characterization. I like kind of what, you know, she brings to the table to the show. So, okay, maybe Valentina needs to do something. Whatever plan she, you know, so we'll just kind of leave it as that. Now, Isabella is clearly disappointed in this whole thing because I think Isabella likes Rocco, right? So I think uh, Valentina is not reading the room correctly. Like, she thinks Rocco's kind of like, low-key sexually harassing Isabella when I think they just like each other and they're probably fucking on the side like after work, right? But it's so I was like, I don't really care. I want to keep this puss next to me where I can come and see it. So I was like, okay, girl, I don't think this is going to show up because Rocco was pissed. He was like, customer, like, what the fuck am I doing in the beach club? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, ooh, girl, like, whatever. But I guess up to Albie. So the show starts off, Albie's hunching Lucia, like she's riding him, titties out, la la la. And you know, she's like, you gonna come for me? He's like, uh, then we have the transition to like the waves crashing, which is nice. Like always like a good screen transition, you know, especially there's something that kind of refers to it. So the transition, typically when you have the television show, it'll kind of play into what's previously happened, happens in the previous scene and leads us into the other scene. Like you'll say, so I was like, I'm so mad I could explode. We'll cut and then we'll see a pot boiling over and someone's cooking and lead us in, right? So they come down, the transitions in the show is, are, are usually really good. Very great as always. So then the next day after they get done hunching, he's she's getting ready to leave and he's all kissy kissy because he thinks he done found his like Italian boo thing. And she's like, oh, uh, where's my money? And he's like, oh, and she was like, yeah, it's usually 2000 euro overnight. And she's like, oh, uh. and so then she just was like, oh my God, more motherfuckers who ain't paying me, right? So she's going to play the long game with Albie because she knows that she can get more than 2000 for a night. So even if she gave him the first one free, she could get more and more and more out of here. So he's like, okay, well, let me go to the ATM and I'm so sorry. And they have like this whole like awkward little shuffle or whatever. And she's like, oh, no, 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 you don't have to pay. Yeah, 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 you got to pay. So I was like, oh, Albie. But again, Albie deserves a win because Portia did him real down and dirty anyway. So again, it ain't like he taking it out of his rent money, his light bill money or whatever to pay this chick in Italy. So I'm still like giving this a win for Albie, okay? So then Albie shows up for breakfast and is like, oh, hey, I think I'm going to have dinner with somebody else. And they're like, who are you going to have dinner with? And he's turning around and skinning and grinning at Lucia. And then Nono's like, oh. And then Dom is like, oh. And they're like, oh, well, this girl I met or whatever. And he's like, um, I don't know. And then he's like, oh, I kind of need like 200. He's like, I need to go to ATM and get some money out. And dad's like, oh, here's 200 right here. He's like, I need a little bit more money than that. He's like, for what? He's like, none of your business. Like, it's, I, need, it's, I need some money, like whatever. So then, Nana's like, you know what? I think them girls are hookers, right? Or escorts. 
And the LB is like, so what if they are? You don't fuck escorts. Dad didn't fuck escorts. And then the LB was like, I ain't fuck no escorts. Dom is like, crickets, right? And so then we, because what we get, we see the dynamic that we've seen before is that they're all kind of steps of each other. Albi, Dom, and then Nono, right? Which kind of plays into later on in the episode. And Albi's like, well, I just don't want to participate if they're being sex trafficked or they're being exploited. And then I was like, boy, you a fool. All these women ain't saints and they're not being sex trafficked or whatever. They just hoes, right? So he's like, ah, you don't know that, whatever. <coughs> Which leads me into what this episode should have been called. It should not be called, I mean, even though That's Amore is great because we see all these people at the inception or in the process of their love relationships. This episode should have been called Mind Your Business, right? Because half of the problems these people have is if they had just minded their own motherfucking business, right? Or as the Gospel Girl song says, sweep around your own back door before you try to sweep around mine. And if these people swept around their own back door, they would have half the problems they already have because they just need to mind their motherfucking business, right? And that pretty much is what Albie says to his dad. It's like, you just need to mind your business. I'm going to go to ATM. I'm going to kick it with her. And that's what it is. And Dom, and Dom is like, well, I don't think your mother will be happy if, I, if she knew I was like, you hang out with hookers. He's like, no, mama ain't happy because you're a low down trash ass motherfucker who's fucking everything. And who I'm hanging out with is far less egregious than the fuck you doing. So I was like, okay, go on, Albie. Again, I'm all for Albie getting the win on this. He deserves a win, so whatever. So now, the hoes don't laugh after after they didn't got up or whatever. I don't know where Mia spent the night at because they ain't got no room, but somehow Mia just showed up and they get their free breakfast on, which I'm not really mad. Like, again, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? So they get their free breakfast on and Dom's like, let me nip this motherfucking shit in the bud right now. He's like, hey, you still charging shit to my room? She's like, a little bitch the bought. She would have a new outfit on every motherfucking episode and double that, okay? That bill's gonna be so ridiculous. That's why I'm thinking she's gonna be the first one to go because that bill when he gets is gonna be so crazy. He just might murder her right on there, right? So anyway, he's like, fine. Since you still charging shit, why don't you, A, stop seeing my son, and B, don't be sneaking up in my grandfather's room, into my father's room. I was in his room. He's like, bitch, please. Okay, maybe once. He's like, nah, 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 nah. Stay the fuck out of my father's room. Stay the fuck away from my son and go ahead and eat your breakfast or whatever. My, you know, so we're like, okay, whatever. So now we get to dinner because uh, it's just Nono and Dom. And, you know, Dom is feeling some sort of way because he sees Abby with Lucia. And it's unclear whether or not Dom is feeling some sort of way because he really does not want his son to follow in his footsteps or because he's kind of high key jealous that Albie's fucking somebody he used to have sex with. I'm unsure, I'm more thinking it's gonna be the former, former than the latter, but as we know, people are petty and simple, so it could be that. And no one's like, the fuck is wrong with you? Like, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> people get home, he's gonna do that, he's young, whatever. And then Dom is like, oh, I get this from you. You know, I never learned how to be intimate. <coughs> Excuse me, I thought I was, that this cold was going to be gone, but of course it starts up as soon as I start doing video. And then I was like, don't be blaming that shit on me. I haven't had no sex with hookers. And he's like, you never taught me how to be intimate with a woman. You never taught me how to, you know, love someone or whatever. And then he's like, look, your wife, your mother loved me. She was fine. She was okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, he's like, no, she was bitter, she was lonely, she was upset, how deluded are you? And you can see in No-No's eyes that he recognizes the truth, but instead of him going ahead and apologizing for what he's done, he's just like, your mother loved me, that's what it was, and, you know, that's, that's my story, I'm sticking to it, right? Which is so typical of that generation, like... Like, parents, like, parents just don't have the ability or capacity to be like, you know what, I'm sorry, I understand this may have been your experience, that's not what I intended. No, they always got to be ten toes down, right? Like the, the concept of parents from that generation actually apologizing for their children, no, you always get, I did the best I could, or that's just how we are, a whole bunch of excuses, when really an apology and I, I see you, I see your hurt, or whatever, would have gone 10,000 miles better, but no, no, it just stays 10 toes down, it's like, nah, she loved me, and you just said your motherfucking problems, or whatever. 
So now I get to me and Lucia, right? So first we find out now that Cam and Ethan then gooped her for over 13, 1800 euro, right? Because she says that it was $2,000 for an overnight. Cam only gave her 1800. I'm sure Lucia charged him for Mia too. So she's out like a whole other $1,200. So when she's waking up for breakfast, she's giving Cam the mean eye and they're all scooching down in their chair, trying not to make eye contact. She's like, they still owe me money. I'm like, girl, you ain't gonna see none of that money, right? Like you just might as well just take that L and just decide you ain't gonna see none of that money because that's not gonna happen, okay? So, uh, they call the Valentina the Bruja, the witch, or whatever. So Valentina's like passing through. Mia runs after her and was like, oh my God, can I still play the piano? She's like, shoe flash shoe girl. Like, no, I ain't got your whole ass playing no piano. Blah, 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 right? So in the meantime, right, um, Lucia is still stunting on Abby, right? So if she stunts on Abby, she's just like, yeah, this guy kind of owes me money out of this this guy or whatever. So she's gonna play this stunt. So, she, so she's gonna get, you know, twelve hundred instead of you know two thousand. She'll get the twelve to make it for Cam, and then just have the fuck session from Albie Beal for free, right? I don't know what the whole economics is of this. I just know that this is a long game stunt that she's pulling on Albie. And I was just like, girl, again, just take the L. Or, you know, just have that conversation. Like, you both, like, are adults. Like, this is what my rate is. I may give you a discount. This is this what it is. But she keeps acting like she ain't going to ask for some money. But then she's going through doing holy ass shit, right? So I just would have been like, obviously, Albie's not experienced enough to be like, okay, if we're going to be paying for this shit, What's my rate? What's my time? What's my budget? Boop, 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 boop. And instead, she just skidding and grinning and liking and kissing and hunching and whatever. And, you know, like she's doing the dad, like running up the bill, right? So, like, all this kissy pool stuff, is that is she charging for that? You know what I'm saying? Is that, like, dinner time? Is she charging for that? Or is she just charging for the fucking, right? So, it's just very unclear, like, when when did the whole meter start and when does the whole meter go off? Like, that, that would have been my questions, right? But... You know, the difference between me and Albie is like 26 years. So there we go, right? So um, anyway, so then she sees Cam at dinner and then she gives him the evil eye and chases after Cam. And then he's like, where's my money? He's like, I'm going to get it, bitch. Shoo, shoo, shoo. And then she's like, I want your phone number. He's like, hell no. And don't be trying to mean mug me every time you motherfucking see me because my wife is here. And you definitely will get no money if you blow my spot with my wife. She's like, I want my money. I was like, girl, again, you better off just taking this whole L and start trying to, try to follow Cam. Which once again makes Lucia now... Two and O likelihood to be dead because either Don may kill her or Cam may kill her because her dumbass don't know how to read the motherfucking room and take a fucking L, right? So I was just like, whatever. So then later when Lucia, it was with Albie, they run into this guy in the street who she says is a lesso who she allows Albie to think like maybe that's her pimp. That's her pimp or whatever like that. I don't think that's her pimp at all. I think she had somebody on her text me like, I'm going to be here. This is how we're going. Because they said they had to wait a long line for gelato. An hour for gelato? Come on now. So she texted somebody. was like, meet me on the street. We're going to go this way. And I need you to pull this stunt on me because I need this motherfucker to make up for the money that I'm losing. Right? I don't think that's her pimp at all. So I was like, okay. Now let's get to Ethan, Harper, Cam, and Daphne. Okay? <sighs> okay, so Ethan wakes up the next morning, like basically fully dressed, right? Everybody else is waking up half naked, kind of naked, because they've been fucking and getting it in. And literally, Harper and Ethan are waking up in fucking ball gowns and shit because nothing, ain't nothing going on in their bedroom whatsoever, okay? So he wakes up, goes to the bathroom, and he sees the condom, okay? And immediately he's like, uh, Harper, what is this? Her response is, I don't know, you tell me. See, that type of shit would have made me so fucking mad, right? What the fuck you mean, you tell me? What the fuck? Where did you find the condom? Where, you know what I'm saying? That type of shit just would have made me, like, motherfucking explode. So then she's like, well, I found it in the couch, whatever, what happened? He's like, it's not mine, trust me. He's like, well, what happened? And he's like, it's Cam's. She's like, what? 
who would care? We found these hookers. We had some drinks. He brought them back. And she's like, you had hookers in our room and did Molly and he fucked them on the couch? Yes, bitch. That's pretty much what happened, right? But it wasn't me. So then she's like all hit her feelings. She's like, look, I'm sorry they tell you, you know, but you know, I don't lie to me. You know, you know, you know, I don't lie to you. They try to do something, try to kiss me. Nothing happened. Now, we've already established that Ethan fucked up by not telling her immediately when she got back what happened. But what I'm also realizing is the re reason Ethan didn't say anything is because Harper's one of those people who, any and first of all, Ethan is non-confrontational and Harper is very confrontational, right? So therefore, he does not like conflict and Harper just thrives off of it because she gets to get her way. So he's like the best way that he think they'll probably navigate their relationship is him not having any conflict with her because of the fact that she just always ends up getting her way anyway. And he's just very anti-confrontational, right? Which is also parentheses for most straight men, like also laziness and selfishness too because he doesn't want to put forth the effort. <coughs> Excuse me, but you know, in a, in a very superficial way, he's just very off, you know, anti-confrontational, non-confrontational, and, you know, just getting with Harper. So she's going to be in her feelings all motherfucking day. So then they go outside to have brunch after the hookers pass, and Harper's going to make some snide-ass remark about, like, oh, maybe we should do some Molly and get fucked up. Cameron's like, ah, oh, fuck. Ethan's like, ugh. And I was like, no, 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 no. See, they, like, as I said in the first episode, me and Harper would have had a very serious talk after the first fucking day that she started showing her ass because either she would have had to get her tune right or she would have to go to fuck home, right? Because that type of non-passive aggressive, slippery, slidey, snidey shit, that, that I just don't do well with that, right? Like either say what you're going to say, get the fuck over it, don't get over it, right? But this whole like, we gonna make comments all motherfucking day? Nope, nope, and nope. Right? Because they go to the winery and she decides to get drunk and start talking about have y'all had a threesome? Have y'all fucked the same person? Like, bitch, mind your business. Daphne done already told you she don't care who the fuck her husband's fucking because she makes it up on the back end, either by money or fucking somebody else. So why are you upset, right? If your husband told you it's not him, why are you upset? So the reason I get kind of upset about this is because I've experienced in my life where people jump to a conclusion that is incongruent with what the record shows, right? So for example, if Ethan has not, if Ethan does not, has never lied to you, has never shown himself to be a trifling ass, trash ass motherfucker, why would you jump to that conclusion, right? He's like, look, I've never lied to you, I've never done, it. I've never done anything. Now, we know that people can flip on a dime and we can turn and people can do jack in a box crazy shit all the time, right? But the fact is, there's nothing in this character that which he said that shows you that he would, he would be doing that. You're just being difficult for the sake of being difficult because you're a classist and you're a thought that you are better than this couple, but really they're better than you because they know what they got and they're okay with it, right? You're just not okay with what you have. So therefore now you're feeling like under the totem pole. So at the winery, Ethan lets it slip that every time that Ethan, every time that Ethan liked a girl, Cam would swoop in and fuck them like a week later. And he uses the term mimetic desire. That meaning that every time, you know, every person that Ethan liked, um, Cameron would go after him because he thought that he was, it was, it was a way for him to one up Ethan or at least be in the same status level as Ethan. And Cam was like, why do I want to be the same status with you? I mean, like you broke, you this, you that. He was like, I'm smarter than you. I'm more successful than you. I got my own shit than you. And the fact is you thought that maybe this fuck the people could make you more like me. And Cam was like, and I was like, you know what, Ethan, I know you had to say that and get that out there, but if there's anything we know in this world to be true, that cis white men are some of the pettiest ass people ever. Like literally them and like cis white women, they're like neck and neck. I mean, like he, like he can't just give me like that Cersei Lannister kind of petty or not even like, like that Serena petty from like Handmaid's Tales, but he's very, you could just tell that it was like, mm, mm, mm. that was just the wrong thing to say. Because he's just that type of petty person who will sit and wait and do some fucked up shit just for the sake of the fact that he got his hurt ass feelings, right? In front of his wife and a bitch he barely liked and a person he's known for 20 years. Fuck out of here. Like, so anyway, I was like, Ethan, bro, bad, bad, bad moves. But 
Daphne is the MVP for this episode, right? Because I always can appreciate a very pragmatic, practical person who's like, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, and my tune ain't changing, and this is what it is. So they're going, Harper's still on her bullshit at dinner, right? Talk about threesomes and whatever. And Cam's like, well, since we tell all her business, why don't we, why don't you tell us? You have a threesome? He's like, yeah, I did it with my friend Paula, and you know, whatever. It was in San Juan. And Cam's like, were they your cousins? He's like, no. And while she's telling this story, Cam is under the table touching and flirting and rubbing up on Harper. And I was like, trash, trash, trash. I was like, you only trying to fuck Harper just to either, to A, get back at Ethan, and B, because now he's exposed to the fact that he is better and wretched than you, and you can't have that as a status symbol. So they go outside. Harper goes out to smoke a cigarette. She sees Daphne just living her best, simple, white, rich, white woman life swirling her drink and whatever. And she's like, girl, you okay? Like, you've been in some bullshit like all motherfucking day, right? She's like, I think something happened when we were in Nodo. Daphne's like, I'm sure something did, but whatever. No, like, I really think something happened in Nodo. Period. Bitch, mind your business, right? We've are, Daphne I already said she don't give a fuck about what the fuck she does, and she's okay with that, right? So why are you going to fucking be Captain save a about some shit that doesn't affect you? Worry about you and your man, because Daphne and Cam done fucked probably 17 more times than you and Ethan have fucked on this trip, right? But no, she got to press the issue. And Daphne, like, girl, and then she was like, look, I got me a trainer. He's blonde. He's hot. He's kind of funny. I see him more than I see Cam. You want to see a picture of him? Daphne's like, uh. Harper's like, uh. Girl, she pulls through the phone. like, here's a picture. Showed up, child. It's a picture of this blonde hair, blue-eyed child. And Harper's like, oh, it's a picture of your kids. Daphne's like, oops. Well, all I'm just saying is, find something to make you feel better or get you a trainer, girl. And she was like, Harper was like, and I was like, right, exactly. I was like, girl, don't even try it. So anyway, uh, Ethan and Cam come back, and then they're doing um, cigars. And he's like sucking on cigars, like looking at uh, Harper. And I was just like, trash, trash. And then finally, Ethan catches it. And I was like, ooh, so this is a well. So right now, our tally is, I got two to one Lucia, one and oh, that maybe his cam is gonna be dead, right? Cause I don't know what they're doing with Daphne's makeup, but her makeup, her look has like has improved so much from the first episode. And she just gives me that whole like, you know, Ivana Trump, don't get mad, get everything type of vibe, right? So she just was like, so I don't know whether she's gonna be the one to kill Cam, whether Ethan kills Cam. I don't know. She may end up killing Harper because she's a like, worrisome trifling ass bitch too. I don't know. Now let's get to Tanya and Portia because Tanya got a whole lot of motherfucking nerve, right? She's having breakfast with Portia and she was like, I don't know. Maybe I should have started that healing group from, from that woman in Maui. Maybe, maybe she put a curse on me. And I was like, you need to keep Belinda's name out your motherfucking mouth because Belinda did not deserve half the shit you did. And if she put a curse on you, you'd be the first motherfucker to deserve it. So I was like, oh, here we go with Tanya. So they get ready to go, right? They're going to Palermo with the gays. Now, Portia's leaving her room, okay? And she runs into Alby. And then she gives this like half-ass, sorry-ass apology. Sorry, sorry couldn't hang out, but I really couldn't leave. And Alby's like, what monkey don't stop no show? You look like you were busy. I was busy. We two busy-ass motherfuckers. And I was like, bravo, Alby, bravo. Like he was kind of clumsy with it, but Portia caught the tea like, I'm not bothered, right? Because that's how you need to be, right? Because there are levels of this and you really put dating down and date down with Portia anyway, like real talk. So they go this way, they go that way. They get on the boat with the rich gays and they're on their way. And they're like, oh, how'd you get your villa? Quentin, the British English gay is like, oh, I heard it from my dad on 32, all this upkeep, you know, whatever, right? Then... What we realize is that Tanya really likes the gays because she gets to the Quentin's villa and it's like nice and rich. And Tanya's like, these are ups, these are these are up up gays, right? Like these are high scale gays. And the thing is, Tanya likes hanging out with people who aren't her motherfucking pocket, right? So finally, Tanya gets to hang around with people who are in their same her same kind of socioeconomic class. Like a lot of the things in the show 
is about class, right? Because Albie, instead of thinking that, that Lucia and Mia just want to be whores for the sake of being whores, he thinks they're being whores because of their impoverished economic condition, right? Nah, they just like being whores, right? So there's a very classes, classes of plays, a lot of this. Like, especially like you think about Harper and her relationship with Cam and Daphne. And, you know, everything is all about through the lens of class and kind of people, how people view themselves in relation to other people in different classes. So Tanya's having a great time, right? Because she's like, finally, I can have where people are rich. He can be digging in my motherfucking pocket and I can do whatever, right? So the gays are like, we're going to go see Madame Butterfly. You should come because your life is just as tragic as this shit. And then Jack is like, oh, I don't want to go to fucking Madame Butterfly. Let's go out or whatever. So they go to Madame, the, they go to Madame Butterfly and Dixie asks Tanya is sitting in one of the balcony, it was one of the balcony things. And she looks over this woman and she's like, is that the Queen of Sicily? Girl, the gays were like, this bitch. Yeah, bitch. That's the Queen of Sicily. And Tanya's all waving or whatever. But... They watch the opera. It's really good. It brings uh, Tanya and Quentin to tears. And you kind of see a little, they have like share a little moment, you know, like kind of like, oh, you know, you could be my new gay best friend, right? You're like, you'd be digging in my pocket and you got some class and some culture to you. So Tanya's really feeling it. We, meanwhile, Jack and Portia go out for rice balls or whatever. And they're going out to, you know, rice balls. And then all of a sudden they run out. They like dash and dine. And Portia's like, what the fuck is this all about? She's like, oh, I forgot my wallet. And he's like, oh, I could have paid. He's like, oh, no, that's okay, whatever. And I was like, forgot your wallet? Like, you got, like, some flimsy ass shorts. But if you didn't have your wallet, you would have known you didn't have your wallet as soon as you got in an Uber, right? That's when you'd be like, hey, turn the fuck back around. Or, hey, uncle, Venmo me or sell me some money because I ain't got no money because everybody got Apple Pay or whatever like that. Like, you could have worked this motherfucker out, no wallet or whatever. Or just could have told Portia, hey, I got no money. Let me Venmo you, my uncle, send me some money. da da ba ba boo right? So as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, you're a prostitute, right? So they get back to the house. Tanya and Quentin are talking. He, they, you know, and Quentin tells his story because you know he tells like Gore Vidal, who's a fantastic writer, says I can understand you know uh, having companionship. I can understand ordering sex in the afternoon. I'll never understand the love affair. And Tanya's like, have you ever been in love? And he's like, yeah, once. There's this cowboy from Wyoming who I met, and I'm like. Is this motherfucker telling the plot a fucking broke back mountain? Like, it just literally seems like, oh, I fell in love with him, but he was hopelessly straight. And I was like, is he really like gooping Tanya with the plot of broke back mountain here, or did this really happen? I think he's just lying to Tanya. Because I was like, what? What? I was like, literally, it sounds that literally is a plot of broke back mountain. And I was like, girl, like, seriously. So they go and leave. We cut. Uh, Jack and Tom, Portia get back. He's like, oh, I got to do something for my uncle. I'll be right back or whatever. She's like, okay. She's all goody, giddy. Her pussy's all wet. She's sopping it up. She's getting to bed, right? So Tanya's sleeping, and then Tanya wakes up, okay? She has an apple on her thing, okay? She I guess she's hungry. I guess she wants a drink. So she starts to wander around somebody else's house in the middle of the night. Mind your motherfucking business, okay? So then she starts hearing groans. Everybody else in the universe is like, somebody's fucking in this house. Bitch, go mind your business. No, Carmen San Diego in the nightgown wants to go and figure out what the fuck is going on. And so then she opens the, she like, here's the moans, opens it, and we see Jack fucking Quentin. And I was like, eh, okay, that plays, right? And then she's all like shocked or whatever, like who shot J.R. Dallas type of shit. And the funny thing is, is that I watched this episode today um, because I wasn't, as you know, I wasn't really feeling that well, so I wanted to kind of watch it, like, totally cogity, and I was on Twitter, and I had to get off, because people were talking about White Lotus, and I saw this, um, just a post about the actor and how he had to, how it was such a difficult scene, and I was like, this is why we need to, A, I have no problem with straight actors playing or in gay roles, but stop putting out press releases or pressers or articles after the showing of the actor in a gay scene to confirm their heterosexuality. They do that all the time. 
Every time a gay straight actor does a gay role, there's some kind of article or tweet or something that lets everybody know that they're not really gay. Because you know what? Gay people ain't doing that shit. No, gay people aren't sending out tweets and articles about how gay they are after they play a straight actor. And it's just like really infuriating because you wouldn't have to do that if you cast gay actors anyway, right? But I get off my soapbox to say three things, okay? Number one, mind your business, Tanya, right? Number two, that sexual position is what you do for the television, right? Because I was like, what? Like, I'm 5'8", okay? So that looked like a really high bed. So either, as, and so Jack is probably taller than me anyway. So as a verse top anyway, I would either have to be standing on something or we would have been in the bed. Secondly of all, Quentin's head would have had to be down. So it's head down, ass up. So please don't try to replicate that in real life because the only way they did, the reason they did that is that if Quentin was face down, ass up, and his head was either turned to the side, then if it was turned to the right, Tanya wouldn't be able to see who it was. And if it was turned to the left, he would have saw her when she walked in, right? So that's what the kind of framing you do just to kind of get the whole grotesque moment. But that's not a real sex position. Please don't try that at home because you will get embarrassed and that person may, you know, so just, just don't try that at all. So anyway, I never thought he was his nephew anyway, right? Like when he first was introduced, like, this is my uncle. They didn't tell you how they're related. They were swapping no family stories. Yeah, my dad and his dad, my mom and him and whatever like that. It was just kind of like, mm, he's probably a hooker, right? And everybody, I think people were like on social media were all like, oh my God, oh my God. And I was like, y'all need to get y'all some interesting sex life. Like now, since I was wrong on Valentina, as I'm owing to, he may end up being the real nephew, and I'll just do a homemade couple next week. But I think he's just a straight-up hooker. I just think that's a hooker because Quinn is like, he's really into beauty and beautiful things. And Jack is nice to look at. Like, that little ass shot, like, I wouldn't uh, skip school for it. I mean, I probably, I mean, I wouldn't eat, I would have eaten it for lunch. But it wasn't like, no, oh, whatever. But, I mean, Quentin says he's really into beautiful things and he would die for beautiful people. So, y'all let me know whether or not y'all think that that is really his nephew or whether he's a hooker. I'm rolling my Yahtzee dice on hooker, but since I've already been wrong, my credibility is kind of shaky anyway. So, just let me know what y'all think. Um, but anyway, that's the episode. Thank you, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and I will see you guys next week for another episode. Bye.